Hello everyone, welcome back to another exciting and inspiring episode of On Location with Zara Durrani. Currently we're here in the beautiful Charles Van Sandwich store in the heart of downtown Vancouver in the historic Gastown district. Joining me is someone who I'm so excited to have on the show today. Uh, he's taking a little breaky break from work right now. Uh, works around the corner. He's the head of the acting department at the Vancouver Film School. Uh, he is a fantastic actor, a playwright, and someone who I've known for quite some time, and I'm so mm -hmm. excited to have him join us today to talk about his career, his work over the years, transitioning from acting on camera to voice acting as a playwright, and everything in between. Omari Newton, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you again. Yeah, great to have you here. Yeah. Vancouver Film School, wow, yeah. the head of acting department. That's kind of, I mean, if we go like 22 decades ago, I would have never <laughs> imagined you as like the head of acting department. And here you are. I, life is wild. Life is wild in some ways. I mean, it, although it's interesting, I started off acting in theater, and then I actually moved to Vancouver around when we met, and probably back in 07, 08, probably, around then. But I moved out here specifically to act in film and television, which, mm -hmm. as you know, I did for about a decade. But the whole time, when I was pursuing uh, a career both in theater and film and TV, I did teach, and I did coach actors. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. I mean, it started off kind of um, coaching friends with auditions, and then there was a time where I taught kids acting, and I, I'd always been uh, passionate about a a arts education as well as the arts. So it, it kind of is a natural progression, if I look at it in, in that regard, but, but I never thought I would, I would be the head of the acting department. It just sort of worked out that way. Mm. So. Uh, with everyone who comes on the show, I like to start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to backtrack a little bit. Um, I know, like, over the years, we run into each other, and um, I love to ask people how they got started. When did you know mm -hmm. you were meant to perform? Mm. That this is the career path you were going to choose? Okay. And did you have any, you know, any sort of feedback yeah. that you received from your family? Any mm -hmm. questions, concerns? Mm -hmm. Are you sure you want to be an actor? <laughs> from my family, there were things such as, you know, become a legal assistant right. or a dental assistant, at least something with Scoot a money. regular income uh -huh. and job. Benefits. And then, yes, <laughs> and other stuff you can do on the side. Yeah, I, I'll give you my, my uh, Marvel villain origin story. Oh, please it's do. not a villain, but it's an origin <laughs> story. So uh, when I was a kid, I was born with uh, polyps on my vocal cords. Mm. And I don't know if you know what that is, but like singers get them sometimes. Like I think Adele had to ca cancel a tour once because she had polyps in her vocal cords. And it's when you have these growths in your vocal cords, and as a result, I had a really raspy voice. So when I was a kid, I had like one of these voices like this, and I would lose my voice all the time. And I used to get bullied, and I get teased when I was young. I'm talking like five, four, five, six years old. And they used to call me horse mouth because I, I would go horse, my, my voice would go horse all the time. And I always loved acting, I loved performing, but because I had this kind of strange voice, I could never really get good parts in the school plays. So I remember <laughs> my first role, I was cast as a caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland. So I was like the ass end of the caterpillar <laughs> in the back with no lines. So it was just all these kids walking around being a caterpillar. I think one time I was also a tree who didn't speak. Um, but then in grade three, I had uh, surgery to remove the polyps on my vocal cords, and it was successful. And it was like overnight, my voice went from this crackly, kind of raspy thing to being more clear and being able to speak. But I, here's the Marvel uh, villain origin story. I remember my school nurse at my elementary school said to me, oh, Mari, like, your voice sounds so much better. It's like night and day. The surgery worked. Like, you'll never be like an actor or a singer or anything, but at least now you can talk. <laughs> Right? And you're like, lady. Well, grade three me, like <laughs> low key in my head was like, you'll see. Right? No, sorry. That was really Marvel villainy. <laughs> but no, I, but I didn't think in a malicious way, but I remember being like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an actor. And, mm. and I don't sing, but I, I, use, I don't know if you know this, but I, I used to rap. Um, I was an MC for many, many years. I saw college. that in your bio. I didn't yeah. know about that. No, no, no. Yeah, my, I was in a band called Kobayashi. Our, our stuff is still on, I think it's on like YouTube. You can find some stuff. But we played the Montreal Jazz Fest a couple times. It was a, 
an 11 piece acid jazz ensemble. And so think like the roots back in the day. And I was uh, an MC, so I can't sing, but I did both work in music. And of course, I've been a professional actor now for many years. So that nurse was wrong. That's all I got Maybe you should look her up and send her. But you know, sometimes we need people like that. Yeah. I won't say which school, which, even though I did mention them in the episode prior. Um, but I remember when I was in acting school, mm -hmm. like um, I did some classes around the corner mm -hmm. and several of my teachers, you know, I remember the feeling it wasn't like they flat out said something to me, but making remarks around, oh, you just like look like, you know, mm. more on my physical instead mm -hmm. of like you could bring something to the table right. in that way. And when I had the launch of my first show, Life in Savazar, which I produced, you know, and mm -hmm. it went on four networks, like nationally, and it was independently produced. Respect. And I made sure to like send them the invitation. <laughs> and most of them were there. Yes. And one of them particularly sang. And then, you know, several of them I've seen on set other times and she's like I knew you were gonna I knew you're gonna do stuff and I had Vancouver Sun like, there and Joy TV and uh -huh. this and that and it, I I got some like weird satisfaction and yep. I was like okay <laughs> but yep. maybe there was a reason that person was planted sure. you know that they put the fire in yeah. your belly for you to be like so what was it about performing what was it about being on a stage having an audience yeah. being someone other than Omari or Omari as a character uh -huh. that appealed to you? Well, first off, shout out to the haters out there. I agree with Zara. That's great motivation. From Tom Brady to Michael Jordan, haters are great to motivate you. So anybody watching, it's good. Um, and for me, I was just always one of those kids who I had a really vivid imagination and I had a lot of energy to the point where I think at one point, um, teachers or people at my school thought I had like um, ADD or ADHD because I was one of those kids that would like sit in my chair and you know what I mean? I would constantly be moving j just while paying attention so they thought something was off. Uh, but then I would like watch cartoons and try to do impersonations of the voices that I would see in the cartoons. Or I would play, you know, G.I. Joe with my friends because this is like a little bit before video games and Nintendo where you would actually play with physical G.I. Joes. But I, was, I would always never make the G.I. Joe characters the characters, I would create new characters and give them all voices and have like backstories. So I, I was just always um, uh, full of energy and had an elaborate imagination and loved telling stories and playing make-believe. So when I started acting, it just came really organically to me. Like it was just how I used to play for fun, so. You're like being a kid and now you're like, oh my God, can I go to school for it, make money? Sure. You know, well, especially here in North America. Like, mm -hmm. I grew up in Pakistan, so this was not something that, as a kid, that yeah. I ever imagined that I would pursue as a career that mm -hmm. would help me make a living. Yeah. You know, as my mic falls. <laughs> well, I'll cover while you're, while you're clipping your mic back on. So, interestingly, I actually never went to school to study acting formally. Mm. What, what happened was, I, I was, in addition to all the other stuff, I was really into sports when I was a kid. And uh, I used to play basketball, I used to play football. And I remember one year I quit football <laughs> to focus on basketball and got cut from my basketball team. So I had this like big gap in my schedule because there wasn't playing sports. And my high school drama teacher, uh, her name was Linda McKenty. Um, she's, she's since passed away, may she rest in peace. But she was amazing. Linda McKenty uh, convinced me to try out for the school play. And I remember it was um, Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. Hmm. I played Benedict, did the play, and during one of the matinees in this high school play, there was three people in the audience and one of them was an agent. And after the show, this agent came up to me when I was, I don't know, 16, 17, and mm -hmm. was like, have you ever thought about doing this for a living? And I didn't know at the time that there was an acting scene in Canada. I didn't really know about what And this is in Montreal? This was in Montreal, okay. yeah, Beaconsfield High School mm -hmm. back in the day. So I signed with my first agent when I was like 16 or 17 mm -hmm. and started going to auditions and. And then by age 19, I was cast as a lead in a play. So I, I actually, I got my start in the theater professionally, got my union card in the theater, and then became a TV actor af after. Yeah. Nice, and to have an agent at like 16 to 17, like wow. Yeah. I'm doing this a long time. Long <laughs> time. Um, 
I was taking a look at your IMDb for someone who says that, oh yeah, I don't know about acting anymore. I'm like, wow, <laughs> look at all this like voice stuff that you're doing. And you know, that was a big thing that I didn't yeah. know that was happening like in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And like the fun of, I, I've like done this year some walla stuff and yeah. some like dubbing and when they want like south asian mm -hmm. or like pakistani or indian sure. accent or like you know more thank goodness now they're bringing in people with yeah. like authentic like you know hindi yeah. or urdu accents mm -hmm. and i was like I, I did a thing with like Dave Patel, like for his first thing, but like seeing your work, I'm like, you were doing so much voice stuff. Like, how yeah. is that? Tell us like, how is that voice different when you're doing the animation mm -hmm. and building that character, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and making them different because now no one's seeing you. Right. No one's yeah. seeing Amari. You can dress as whatever when you go in there. Yeah. When I was on My Little Pony, like My Little One Day, and like all these people, they were so comfortable. No one's wearing makeup. <laughs> yeah. I was the only weirdo who came in like, you know, my and all these girls, they're in like onesies and in like their people are so comfortable and yeah. having the time of their lives and making yeah. a pretty decent paycheck as well it's not bad yeah. so how did you transition into voice and what is the building a character like for mm -hmm. when you're doing it for this animated character yes yeah. well the biggest secret that i tell and I, I literally i was in calgary last week teaching voiceover workshops to high school students for the school but the biggest secret of voice acting is it's just theater mm. like animation it's just theatrical style acting the only difference is in a play of course the audience can see you but you're giving the same performance for voiceover and if you ever i mean i'm sure you noticed when you watch in the voice booth actors voice actors are very animated like you're not just standing by the microphone in neutral they're, they're like you're moving and you're you know getting and it was better in the beginning yeah. when i went in there i felt very aware right, and then right. i remember like alistair was like okay just like get give it to yeah. them just like let it go and then the more i was i was like wow this is like fun getting it's comfortable, like right yeah well the thing is you you'll stand out more in voice if you're like very reserved yeah. because everybody's going and I, I tell students like if you ever look on YouTube at like Robin Williams behind the scenes in Aladdin he's going mm. crazy mm. or Benedict Cumberbatch when he plays Smog it's incredible like and that's a full motion capture performance so they really really get into it so that's the first secret is that voiceover is just uh, theater and because I came from this pretty extensive theater background um, when I moved to Vancouver, one of my first major gigs was Bart on the Beach, mm. where I, I booked the role of Aaron in the mm. play Titus Andronicus. And at the time, I had just signed with characters, uh, who I'm still with now. Yeah, and, wow. Yeah, Caroline mm -hmm. Young. I think, I think she might have been starting to build her roster back in like 08. But I invited Caroline Young to come see me in the show because mm. I was part of their principal agency, but I knew I wanted to break into voice. Mm. And because Caroline saw me on stage and heard my voice, she knew that I would be a good um, voice actor. And uh, she's been my agent ever since. It's been almost 20 years I've been with Caroline and I've just been working, growing those skills. Yeah. Um, I was talking about the show Continuum with Ryan. Yeah. And that was such a fantastic show with so yeah. many local actors. Mm -hmm. and. A sci-fi show that is like really well done. Yeah. It just sucks you in. You know, sometimes you have like I love sci-fi. Like I grew yeah. up watching like sci-fi. I learned English by watching sci-fi mm -hmm. and classic MGM TNT movies. And mm -hmm. you know, because we literally got two channels in Pakistan, <laughs> and this is like ten million years ago. Continuum was so fantastic, yeah. and I had no idea you were in this show. <laughs> And I'm like, that guy looks really familiar. <laughs> like, you know, it's like in these like gray overalls. I think they were gray. Um, orange, and I, I think, but yeah. Okay, or, or, okay. Or red or orange, they were some yeah, kind yeah. of like sure, sure. overalls. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm like watching. I'm the type of person when I get into a show, if when I really get into it, yeah. I watch it all night. Sure. Like I binge watch it yeah. and your name pops up. And I was like, yes! Like, <laughs> I'm like, that face was familiar. That's why. I was like, yeah. that is so cool. Yeah, yeah. I was so like proud of you. The oh, fact that you. this is someone that I knew like, you know, many years ago and to see you find yeah. success and to yeah. be on screen and you know and you weren't being omari you right. know because yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah, were like yeah. and with the computers and the glasses <laughs> and you were just yeah. 
And there was some, I, I forget which episode, because this is a while ago right. that I watched it. Like, I think it's been over a decade ago that sure, I saw this. Sure. And I remember there's one episode that is kind of more focused on your yes. character. Either yes. you go missing or I, someone I escaped like... escaped from a mental ward. Yes. I, I had a, an army of cockroaches. I, yeah, I know that one well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And how was it working on that show? That's oh. such a fantastic cast. And I love yeah. the whole time sequence yeah. stuff. It, it was a dream come true. Honestly, it was, um, I mean, as you saw, I just saw Ryan, I haven't seen him in ages. It really was like a family. And just so you know, Ryan yeah. was just literally sticking around, even though we verbally didn't talk about it. He was sticking around to, say, to say hi. Yeah, oh, yeah, really he sweet. came in all the way from that's Squamish. Really and, and he's well, like, that's Amari, right? Who's coming next? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> well, we, I mean, we, it just, it, that was the vibe on set. And I think, I think it's a couple things. I think one, like you said, it was a Canadian show. Because hmm. oftentimes, not all the time, but sometimes as Canadian actors, and there's so many talented actors in Canada, but often we get cast on American shows mm -hmm. where like one through seven of the call sheet are American. And now your mic. <laughs> now my mic, there we go, got it. Yeah, if you get cast on an American show where one through seven on the call sheet are American, and sometimes there's like a vibe or an attitude where they treat the Canadians like mm. the help. But this was a show that was created by uh, a, not only a Canadian, but like a Vancouver resident. Mm -hmm. Shout out to um, Simon Barry. Simon Barry. Who, who was an amazing showrunner and great to work with. The cast was like top to bottom mm -hmm. Canadian, largely uh, local actors. Mm -hmm. And they were people who, I mean, other than me at the time, because that was my one of my big breaks on TV, it was like a who's who of sci-fi in Canada. Like Tamil Panic, like Roger yeah. Cross, Lexa Doig, uh, Tony Amendola, Ryan Robbins. So it, it was wild for me because I'd recognized all these people from TV. So and I, I told Ro Roger and I are friends now, but I remember the first day, I remember Roger from 24, and I sat down in the makeup chair and Roger was sitting next to me, and it took me a while to, to like, relate to him like a person not just be like oh my god it's so we just and to the credit of the cast like all of them from day one were so welcoming like literally and i've said this before but it's true lexa doig who has done a billion tv shows like lexa has been on she's been on everything lexa literally at the time i was like renting a studio in the west end she literally found out i was like taking cabs to set and would pick me up and drive me to set Hmm. This doesn't happen. Hmm. Like she was a big star. She'd done a bunch of stuff, but we hit it off and she found out like I think one day after set I told her I was like waiting for a cab or whatever. And she's like, oh, I'll give you a lift home. And my cast member would find and, and sometimes she would come in early. Like she her scene might not be late. She would come in early, so shout out Lexa Doig, like just a super, super solid human. Hmm. Roger Cross, nicest guy ever. Even like Alex Ponovic just came to Vancouver Film School to talk to my students. I met him on that show. We still keep in touch. We're still friends. Ryan, stuck around, say hi. Like, it was a it was a dream, dream job, and we had four beautiful, amazing seasons. I got to go to Dragon Con. I got to go to Fan Expo Vancouver. Like, I was living out a lot of childhood dreams on that show. So, it's incredible. And you're, especially when it comes to that kind of make believe, where mm -hmm. you know you're going back in time in the yeah. future, and I think that the I I can't think of the actor's name because him and his son. We're in the show, and he's kind of this guy who's sort of homeless, and he's talking oh. to himself a lot. Ian Tracy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And they filmed another it. Another legend. Like, yes. And yeah. they filmed the scene around Gaston. Yes. Till yeah. then, I didn't know it was filmed here. Yeah. And I was like, oh my god, because some of these people, like Roger Cross, and like I'd interviewed them before, sure. and I was like, okay, another Canadian actor, sure. but I didn't got, clue it. Yeah, 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 I didn't sure. clue it in that it's filmed here. And it and it, the show was set in Vancouver. Like that's the thing, right? Yeah. Like oftentimes Vancouver plays Seattle or New York. Mm -hmm. It was a show shot in Vancouver, Vancouver that was playing Vancouver. So that was also really really cool. Just not having to pretend we're in a different city. And a lot of so. like locals shining and something that is truly entertaining and captivating, mm -hmm. like really sucks you in. It made me sad when it, I wasn't like, what do you mean? We're not going further. I, I wanna I keep, know. because oh, I, I, I love those like, um, when it, anything that is sci-fi related yes. to time yes. and when you're going back and into the future and different dimensions yeah. and this can also happen but when it's written well and explained well where you believe that yes oh, this can happen brilliant yeah brilliant yeah simon si i mean simon's gone on to have incredible success like he's working on warrior now he's did a bunch of stuff like 
it was a, a, a really like the stars aligned in the writing, in the directing, in the producing, in the cast, and it was it was brilliant. Yeah. And you do, worked on this show, I think, when we ran into each other at Chapters, and I was I, like seeing I think there so. was a Blue Mountain. Oh, Blue Mountain State. State. Yeah, yes, yeah, in, yeah. In Montreal, you were yes. working on that. And yeah. Tell us about that experience. That's a wild story, and I've I've told some people this story, and I was like, I feel like they didn't react appropriately to how wild of a story this is, but I'll explain. So, I am from Montreal. Mm -hmm. I moved to Vancouver when I was 26, but I'd been doing theater in Montreal, working really hard. Moved to Vancouver to pursue uh, more film and TV. Uh, Starting off a bit slow, was doing a bunch of extra work. Then I booked that play, um, Tense Andronicus. And then I sent an audition tape from Vancouver to Montreal for this pilot for the Spike TV show called Blue Mountain State. Mm. And I remember I had an in-person callback for uh, this role on Blue Mountain State in Montreal. And I just happened to be going back to town because my niece was getting baptized, I think it was. Mm. So I happened to be going back to Montreal because I wouldn't have been able to afford flying back for a callback, but the director and producer were there. So I had to be back in town and I auditioned for this TV series, Blue Mountain State, and I ended up booking the gig, right? This was the pilot at the time. Mm -hmm. We didn't know it was going to go. Here's the part where it gets crazy, right? Book the pilot. Goes really well. Pilot gets picked up. We go to shoot the series now. Awesome, right? So I show up to wardrobe, and I learn that we're shooting at my old school, at my old college. It's shot at John Abbott College, where I was a graduate, which is like five minutes from my parents' house, right, where I grew up. The uniform we're playing in, I used to play football back in the day, the uniform we're playing in is identical to the uniform that I used to play in when I lived in Montreal. My character plays the same position and wore the same number. No. I swear to God. No. And I've told people this story and they're like, oh, cool. And I remember I told some castmates and they're like, oh, cool. I like, what do you mean, oh, cool? It is a big deal. It's insane. This is manifesting in synchronicity at its and, finest. But it was, it was to the point, Zara, I swear to you, I thought I was being pranked. I thought that it was like an elaborate setup and they were pretending I did, booked a TV series. Did you have like moments like this? Like somebody pinch me? Like you're no, on set and you're just like... It was surreal. Is this... It was like, surreal. Is this life? Like, so what do you think... How long did that... How long did you work on that? We, because I remember when yeah. you were posting about it like yeah, on, yeah. through Facebook. You know, through Facebook you yeah. see people's success sure. and I was like, oh my God, this is so fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Look at you up there. I think I was <laughs> like at, I don't know, at an airport or somewhere where, you know, or in a, a, where I saw you on TV. And I was like, man, because I remember yeah. when we were doing background work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on uh, Fantastic Four. Fantastic yeah. Four, you know? Like, well, and then to see, because it's really great when you see people when they're getting started, sure. which I feel like, sure. you know, from the your, in oh, the yeah. beginning of your Vancouver journey. That was the beginning of my TV yeah. career. Yeah, and then to see, and then to see you in Continuum, and then you were posting about Blue Mountain. Uh-huh. I was like, wow, because to me, I'm the type of person who believes that if someone I know has had the success or had yeah. found this, then that means it's I'm going to get, yeah, yes. yeah, yes. it's possible. Totally. And I will have some of this as well, totally. because then it means there's plenty of it to go yes. around. Yes. I also, path, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, what was that whole experience like? It, Walk us through. It, it was, I mean, actually, interestingly, Blue Mountain State came before Continuum, actually. That was my first yes, big break on TV. And it, it was, again, like knock on wood, it was a dream experience. Like mm. I just got really lucky. My character was the best friend of like the main guy, who's Alan Richson, who I haven't seen in a while, but like we, he's a great dude. He's currently playing Jack Reacher on the Amazon series Reacher, but we were best friends on the show. Great dude, and, and I got to work with these like great Canadian and American actors. And it, it was really like my intro to acting in television. Hmm. Like I, I, cause I didn't, at the time I did a lot of theater, but I, I kind of learned by watching them and my character only had a couple lines per episode, but I was in a bunch of scenes. So I got to watch and learn and, and get some great punch lines in there and react. And, and the creators of the show, uh, Eric Falkner and Chris Romano, who goes by Romanski, were these guys who were like my age, these comedians from Boston, and we just really bonded. We're still friends to this day. Like, mm. we were at a Canucks game last year, you know? It was just one of those situations where I got very, very lucky, and it happened to run for three seasons, and then we did a movie. 
I have a question for you. Yes. Because you were like, I didn't do acting school or acting classes. Yeah, I yeah. do theater. What do you say to your students <laughs> who are like, well, Mr. Newton, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. what advice would you have for us? Because like, why are sure. we in class? Like, sure. I would love to hear. I personally feel for me, I'm an experiential learner. Mm -hmm. I'm not really a studious kind of person. Mm -hmm. I need to do the thing, fall on my face, make mistakes, mm -hmm. break things, and learn that way. I'm sure. not, everyone is a different kind of learner. Yeah. It sounds like you have to experience yeah. and get into it yourself. I, well, I would say this, right? You definitely don't have to go to school to have an acting career, but I wish I had a school like Vancouver Film School when I started mm. because I had to learn, and I, I joke about this, but it's through, true, like through like public failure and public humiliation, lick my wounds, regroup and try again. Whereas if you're in school, all those big mistakes you make, all the like not knowing what you're doing, spiking the lens and missing your mark, it's better to do that in a class where your teachers can adjust you. So by the time that you get and to set, set up on set, they're like, sir, what are you? Dudes. And there was, and when I started, Tell like, us, can you share some stories with us? Oh, I didn't know what I was, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, on Blue Mountain State, I didn't, like, I had all this, I mean, obviously I did something right that kept me around, but I had all this energy and, but just learning how to, like, keep energy Contained. and stay in the scene while hitting the mark mm. is something that you, you learn mm. through watching other people who are really good at it. And I remember, actually, my boy, uh, Darren Brooks, who was on Blue Mountain State, He's also an actor who was on The Bold and the Beautiful for years. Ah. He was a machine. Mm. Like, um, soap opera actors are machines. Because mm. they do, like, an episode a day. Mm -hmm. The amount of dialogue they do. So, And I remember Darren was, like, so good at hitting his mark, and he'd never drop his lines, and he, would, he was just a machine. And just watching guys like that who had so much practice was the way that I got to learn. So that's what I would tell people. Yeah, you, you can learn on the job. It's just way more pressure and the stakes are way higher because if you if you mess up badly on the job they might not ask you back if you mess up badly in the classroom <laughs> then that's what you're there to learn you that's know? very well said like something i had to learn like the hard way i remember it was like a booking a day and it was like second unit on uh the, the hundred mm -hmm. and you know we're starting like it's like i'm like the only actor we're mm -hmm. uh, we're starting really like wide and like my brother is dying and mm -hmm. I'm carrying him mm -hmm. and I'm like, you know, it's this thing sure. and this is how they're going to open the episode or the end the episode, something, something like that, season four. And they're doing these like master like crane shots and I'm just like so in it because the executive uh -huh. producer was there uh -huh. and it's all like <laughs> sand, you yep. know, like in Surrey. And yep. so no one's like coming to tell me stuff. They're yelling like super far away. And like I'm like the only performer in like all this crew. And I'm it's in the middle of the summer, super hot. I'm giving it all my emotions. Uh -oh. My close up is at the end of oh, the day. Oh no, that's so <laughs> Classic, the classic, and you were dead by the end. And they're like, now, you know, give us emotions. You're crying. And like all day, you know, in the heat, they can't <laughs> even. And um, they got in a stunt double for me, but I ended up doing my own falls because oh, like man. I could. Yeah. And no one could come in the sand to give me water. So it's in like, like a day before my birthday in the summertime. And I'm just like sweating so much. And because the kind of stuff they got me was just in case they had to pad me and stuff. Yeah. So I'm just like dying. So yeah, by nothing. the time four yeah. or five o'clock comes in after like a full day, yeah. they're like so close. I had nothing to give. Yeah. It's, a, it's I sadly. I was like, that was a bad lesson to learn. No one told me that in class. But, and you know what? That's exactly the kind of thing that a school, a good school or a good class, right, will teach you is understanding when it's a wide shot, when it's a crane shot, when it's your close up. And the veteran actors, you know, you want to be giving something every take. But you know that the money is when they're right here, right? But that's what you learn in school. Mm. Yeah. So you, do you, I'm assuming, like, t tell us about your involvement. I mean, we'll go up and jump back to your acting and your yeah. voice career, because I'm very fascinated about your voice work. Yeah, and, yeah. of course, your work as a playwright. You know, mm -hmm. I see you talk a lot about that on social media. Mm -hmm. But at film school, like, running, being the head of the acting department, can you yeah. speak to some of that experience what that sure, has like sure, and like yeah. how you've made changes and what yeah. are the students learning in class other I, than not to give all your emotions on, on the wide the shot <laughs> yeah. i mean honestly like i feel like i'm one of the luckiest people in the world i feel very blessed 
because I feel like my job as an acting educator is to be a mentor to the next generation of actors. Mm. And I love actors and I love teaching. So I feel like I, my job is to share insight into what they're gonna expect out in the business, right? And what, I've, what I really, really have worked hard to do, and Vancouver Film School has long been a, a great school. Like my, my dear friend, uh, Jennifer Clement, was the head of department before me for 15 years, and um, I'm, I'm there now. And I try to continue a legacy, which is creating a home for actors. Hmm. Like, to me, I want it to be a safe place. I want it to be a place where people can take risks, but, but in a way that they know they feel supported. And I want it to be the type of school where five, 10, 15, 20 years after people graduate, they come back and visit. If they need to use a room for self-taping or for recording, they can use it. Like, I really want to create a lifelong home for actors. So that's what we're, we're working on. Sounds like you're very, very passionate and you're bringing in, you know, all your friends yeah. from all the shows you've worked on. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's, I like being in class with teachers or getting coached mm -hmm. by teachers. Now that I have your number, I'll be like, hey, Omari. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Hi, I need to put this on tape. Um, I love learning from people who are out there like doing the work. Right. You know, yeah. and like I've been in class with like both, but I think there's something truly remarkable when someone's out there, whether directing mm -hmm. or writing or they're just involved where it's not just about, excuse me to say, collecting a paycheck. Yeah. It's also about well, like you're a creative, you're an artist, you're a performer, mm -hmm. you're doing that, but you're also here teaching it totally. because totally. you love performing and the craft and creativity so much. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for, and I, for me, it's like, and I, I have similar issues, especially when I was a young artist with some of these people out there that to me would charge exorbitant fees for coachings or classes when it's like, you know that these young actors are, you know, working as busboys, like that's their whole paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I always had an issue with that. And to me, I feel like if, if I wanted to make money, <laughs> I would go into real estate. Yeah. You know, not that everything gets money, right? Mm. But if my primary goal was to make money, I would trade stocks and I would go into mm. real estate. To me, if you're working in education, especially art education, your primary focus and passion has to be mentoring young actors. You cannot be there just for a cash grab. You cannot, because people know, like I feel like they can feel it if that's what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're really trying to create an environment of, of people that are just there for the right reasons. And I think we've done a good job. Mm. Um, question. Yeah. Um, for the school, do you guys also have out of curiosity? Uh, classes that are more like part-time, someone we wants do. to drop in. Oh, tell us more. So, now I feel like I'm doing like a, co a commercial <laughs> no, for the school. No, this, this My, is for me. No, I'm I curious. Know. My boss will be very happy, though, that we're getting this in there. <laughs> uh, so, we have short track. Uh, we have something called VFS Connect. Okay. And this is like online short track classes. Mm -hmm. So, in, in fact, actually, right now on Udemy, we also have a voice acting class that is co-created by myself and uh, Marika Hendricks, who's incredible. Well, Marika Hendricks and Roger Harris. Mm -hmm. uh, Marika is an amazing actress, done a million different things. Roger Harris is a director, um, and I, I'm one of the hosts of this uh, workshop. Mm. You can do it on Udemy, it's mm. online, uh, you can learn. It's asynchronous, so it's not like, it, the content exists online, you do it at your own pace. Mm. Or VFS Connect, that's done more over Zoom, mm -hmm. and it's live classes. We have. Some new ones coming up. Uh, Are there any in person by any chance? Not yet, but okay. soon. I like that. Yeah. Because I live a couple of blocks away. Yeah. If it was in person, yeah, I'd yeah. be like, let's go. We, we'll have stuff soon. Right now, we are primarily focused on building up our resources for alumni mm. right now. Mm -hmm. But the long-term vision is to offer not just classes uh, for our alumni, but for the broader community. Uh, this would be more evenings and weekends because mm -hmm. during the week we have our classes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I want, I want this to be a place that serves actors at all levels. Mm -hmm. so. And I like especially when you were talking on the financial and the monetary aspect and like living in Vancouver. Yeah. I love Vancouver, but it's like, you know, it's, it's as crazy. a performer, you know, like yeah. living downtown, uh -huh. it's like ka-ching, ka-ching. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I live, I mean, as you, I lived in the West End for years. Well, mm -hmm. My wife and I recently moved, but I, I work downtown, so I'm still here like every day almost. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in voice and movement. I feel okay. like an improv. 
you know, things that are getting me out of my head and mm-hmm. more in the in my voice and my body more mm-hmm. like, you know, that kind of uh, connection most recently like just a friend of mine just through a referral and we're kind of just like helping support each other like mm-hmm. I help him on social media game <laughs> and right. like and the PR game yep. and he helps me you know uh, in the coaching business but I feel like you, you know it's like forever a student like I can always be mm-hmm. improving and always sure. be growing and learning um, tell me about you know I mean we've talked about continuum mm-hmm. and um, a Blue Mountain State, mm-hmm. and tell me about some moments that you've been on set, whether it was for those shows or a different show, that you had like a moment of, OMG, this is my life. Mm-hmm. Like, is this a different reality? Like, somebody <laughs> pinch me, yeah, yeah. someone wake me up. I know I've had a few of those in my life. They make me, like, I forget to eat, I'm emotional, mm-hmm. I'm just like, I want to soak up this moment as much as possible because... I'm here. Yeah, doing. I'm getting paid. Yeah. My heart is exploding and I'm in the moment. I'm present. I'm loving the people I'm with. Yep. You know, and those are just great moments. Sure. Yeah. I so one of I probably the, no, the credit I'm most proud of on my resume is I've got to voice uh Black Panther for different Marvel shows for the past decade. So yeah, Marvel Lego have done it yeah. for um, there's they have animated motion comics and there's a show on Disney XD called Marvel Superhero Adventures. So I got to do the voice of Black Panther now for a decade, even before the movie came out. And that was a moment I literally cried when my agent called. <laughs> when my agent called and was like, "You booked the role?" Because wow, as somebody who grew up a nerd and liking Marvel stuff, Black Panther was my guy. That was like mm-hmm. the, the coolest superhero, and I, I knew even before the movie came out what that character meant to me mm. and what that character meant to other young black mm. kids that watch cart like I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons, right? So that was definitely my and that, and to this day, whenever I get an email from my agent and like Marvel is attached to it, they're like, you booked this thing, it's from Marvel Studios. There's always a moment where you're like, what is my life? Yeah. You know? So that's definitely like, yeah, booking Black Panther is definitely the one. Hmm. Yeah, like it's, I get all the union emails and I know you're very much involved mm-hmm. um, in the uh, UBCP and yeah. like uh, the committees and um, whether it's through voice, through mm-hmm. giving back and mm-hmm. you know, you speak up on like one uh, on my show and I feel so grateful that I've had this opportunity to bring all these performers and artists and small business owners and you know, I remember like 20 years ago, I moved to Canada. It'll be 24 years in February mm. from Pakistan and, you know, starting out in modeling. And I remember even back then I'd be walking down or when you pick up a magazine, I didn't see many people of color, Yeah. you know, or um, it would be like once in a blue moon or, you know, there would be Channel M back in the day. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not around anymore where there was a South Asian host who brought me on the show because she saw me, my, an article about me. And I was like, oh, my God, there's someone South Asian on television. Yeah. You know, there was um, a few other hosts like on the national television. Now there's so many more on CBC, CTV, Global. Right. Yeah. But, you know, times are changing that now to be a person of color now it's like you know the thing yeah. these days which i'm yeah, very grateful yeah. about and we've seen that change over the last two decades and i know that's something that you're very passionate about and speak yeah. up a lot about i would love to hear your input you know mm-hmm. as a performer mm-hmm. like in front of the camera and mm-hmm. behind and mm-hmm. you, i mean you're doing voice now yep. but you were you know before like with the shows that you did and you mm-hmm. when you were on stage how do you feel like where we are today and mm-hmm. what it's been like over the last few decades well i feel like we've we've come leaps and bounds from where we started i i say this a lot because it's funny but it's also true if you go to imdb i think literally the first two credits on my resume are uh thug number one and slave number two like actually mm. it sounds like a punchline, mm. but those were the first roles mm. i booked in this in, like thug number one slave number two so even like getting to play like on Continuum, this scientist mm. who was like the brains of the operations. Smart. Even that was like such a big departure from the roles I started off playing. And and yeah, I just feel like as as a writer and as an actor, 
there's just much more of a hunger for stories that actually represent Canada or the or the U.S. as we know it. Whereas when I started, it was a very limited, stereotypical vision of what people of color were and what they could do. Now we have, of course, tons of BIPOC storytellers and just more interesting stories to tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so grateful for like, you know, it's like we have funding for yeah. those projects. And, yeah. you know, there was a time like I was so excited to live in France and have my life in Europe. But I'm like, no, as an artist, like the support that I'm getting here in Canada, like I can always go back to Europe. But it's I feel so supported mm -hmm. now. And, you know, it's taken like quite some time, but I'm so proud and excited that I get to see it in mm -hmm. my time. And, yeah. you know, and that's the reason why sometimes I also book jobs and like people will tell sure. me like I fought for you to MC this event because you know versus you know sure. this other sure. person yep. like yep. I really I saw you there and I wanted you to have the job and that's I'm like awesome. man that feels really really good mm -hmm. uh, tell us about some of your work as a playwright like mm -hmm. wow that is a bit of a transition and <laughs> you know when did you decide that you wanted to um, you know put on that hat well, it's interesting, like, I started writing plays when I moved to Vancouver, basically, and it was connected to what we were talking about. I just didn't see people who looked like me on stage in Vancouver, mm. and I didn't see stories that represented my experience in theaters. And um, my, my dear friend and mentor, Diane Roberts, who at the time was the artistic director of a company called Urban Inc., which was actually founded by uh, Marie Clements, uh, who of course uh, wrote and directed Bones of Crows, which is all over Canada right now, mm -hmm. which I had a small role in because of my relationship with her through the theater. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other conversation. But um, yeah, my friend Diane was like, if you're not seeing the stories that you want to see on stage, you should write, like, what would you want to see? Mm. And my first play was called uh, The Lamentable Tragedy of Sal Capone. Mm. It was a hip hop theater piece that was inspired by the real life shooting of this young person of color in Montreal named Freddie Villanueva. And so the, it was, the play was about um, this hip hop group whose DJ gets shot by the police and it's the friends in the group dealing with the aftermath of the shooting of this, uh, of this kid. So that's what inspired me to start writing plays. And, and, and my latest play, my, my wife and I co-wrote, uh, called Red Bone Coonhound, is about language and about how like, different words impact people differently and it's inspired by our lives. Like it's about this interracial couple, a white woman and a black man who are out walking a dog, which we were, and this, this dog comes up and starts paying attention to them and sniffing them up and down, and they ask what kind of dog it is, and the name of the dog is a red bone coonhound. Which for those listening, like that's a real dog name. And for those who don't know, red bone is kind of a slur in the black community where you call a mixed race black person red boned. And coon, of course, is a racial slur. It means you're a black person who's like sold out your own people for your own gain. So to me, I heard Redbone and Coon. I was like, what is this dog's name? And my wife just loves dogs. And she was like, oh yeah, it's a, that's the name of a dog. So the play explores mm -hmm. the complexity of language and how it impacts people. So most of the stuff that we write uh, is about the world that we live and like perspectives that we don't necessarily see on stage or in TV. So. I love that because now you're, I remember I was at the Vancouver International South Asian Film Festival mm -hmm. founded by Agam Darshi and Patricia mm -hmm. Isaac and it's still in the back of my brain to get into writing. Yeah, I don't know you where to, I, you know, I found like interviewing people and all of this, talking to them easy, but I feel like the writing part is mm -hmm. something I need to get to where yeah. it's like, what kind of story do you want to tell? And I was very astonished and also inspired when I saw on social media, I was like, oh, wow, you're getting behind the scenes. Because I remember being at this first Evel Vancouver International South Asian Film Festival mm -hmm. in 2010. And Monica Dio, who was on Legend. Much Music. I remember, Electric Circus, right? Back yeah. in the day. And she was on this panel. And I was the red carpet host and producer. And I was interviewing like, you know, everyone who came in. and. It was maybe 25 people in the audience, you know, and it was her and Zaf Peru and like someone mm -hmm. else and, you know, and having the same conversations around the thug one and the slave number two, the stuff I've always gotten mm -hmm. was either objectifying me right. or with something with an, someone with an accent. Right. 
Right. I was grateful for the job, sure. grateful sure. to get the credit, grateful for the nice check that I got. Uh, but I remember her saying, you're going to have to get out there. And I felt she was speaking at me, but someone else asked the question and she was like, you have to get out there, create the work, it's create true. the project, it's true. put yourself in it, put your friends in it. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking, how will I ever do that? I don't know how, but at least that led to me starting to host and produce yep. and be like, I'm going to put people in the show and have a say in it. Mm -hmm. And who, I feel, you know, yeah, and, and, platform, and like yeah. amplify voice to people that you think should be heard. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. especially more diversity, because sure. I know, especially as an immigrant and especially when English was not my first language and like, you know, trying to mm -hmm. cover up my accent and like mm -hmm. all these different things. And, you know, it's so fantastic to see someone that I know find the success and then be in front of the camera shining you know, as a voice actor, and then the work that you're doing at Vancouver Film School and oh, getting you. behind. What advice would you give to someone, like actors or performers mm. who are watching, other than going to VFS, <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give to them, like as if you were talking to the young Omari at like 18, you know, mm. that you would give to the young Omari? I would say, you know, you, you should have the curiosity and the humility to keep learning, but also the confidence to know that the people who are currently doing it aren't much smarter than you. They don't have some supernatural talent that you cannot also have. They've just put in more work and they've understood, they've understood the craft more and you can get there if you put the work in. Because hmm. I think a lot of people of color in particular, internalize this idea that we're not good enough or that this is like rocket science and how could we ever do this? And it's not true. Like, I, I feel like if you, if you get the opportunity and you make the most of it and you put the work and you put your reps in, you can do anything. Mm. Just sometimes for, for reasons that maybe your family did, couldn't afford to send you to art school. Maybe you, you, know, you had to work instead of, uh, you couldn't just focus on your audition because you had to go to work or whatever. Just know that you're, you're good enough and you're smart enough to accomplish whatever you want. You just might have not have had the opportunity yet. And if you really want it and you keep at it, you can adjust the conditions so that you can take advantage of those opportunities. Hmm. That's oh. kind of a long answer. but No, I love that. That leads me to, would you say you've always been a very um, confident person? I find like when I speak to a lot of like whether small business owners or artists, whether it is someone who paints or draws or writes or performs, mm -hmm. you know, there's always that inner critic. I know for me, mm -hmm. my inner critic, depending on, you know, what I'm doing, like in the moment I can be like, oh my God, this is great. And then afterwards I'm like, I could have done this and mm -hmm. this and this. Like I love asking people how they deal with that inner voice, the inner critic mm -hmm. that comes up. Like what is there? Is it like journaling or meditation or mm -hmm. workout mm -hmm. or running or self-talk or just like pretending mm -hmm. it doesn't exist? Like how do you deal with that inner critic, especially as a performer right. and with rejection? You know, the amount right. of rejection performers receive. Right. So it's kind of a funny answer. It's a big call. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but okay. I'm not, in the past, I've answered this question, then I've, I've uh, named specific shows, but I'm not going to name specific shows, but I'm going to make my point specifically, right? Um, everybody knows the types of shows that shoot in Vancouver. I'm not going to name them, but we know there's certain networks that do things very quickly, and the quality of their shows is questionable. Uh, I remember even when I was doing extra work, I would walk, I'd be on set doing these shows and I had enough honesty with myself to be like, this person is not doing anything that I can't do. Mm. This is not rocket science, mm -hmm. right? Now, if I was on set with Daniel Day-Lewis or if I wore Meryl Streep, I'm sure I'd be my mind, but I was like, this is not rocket science, right? So I remember just with my own two eyes being objective and watching work that was happening and knowing the disparity in pay between me doing background and this person, I'm like, this is not a magician, I can do this, right? So that gave me uh, the confidence because I was there on set watching their work mm. to know that if I got the opportunity, I could also do that, mm. right? 
Did that answer the question? It, it totally does answer yeah. the question. So it required like, but also some self-talk and like conviction inside of you to be like, yes, like I've had those things too. And I've also had things where I get envious and yeah. I've had to be like, and I have to be like, okay, my time is going to come and I'm going to do things that are going to make me proud or I'm going to yep. poke myself in places and situations yep. where I'm going to have wins or yep. creating like my own thing. So for example, if you're up for a job and um, if you're up for a job, they're saying you're pinned, they really uh, want you, na uh -huh. na na and then the call comes, oh sorry, they decided to go with this. How do you how do you deal with that? I, oh. I'm, I'll tell you how I deal with it and then yeah. I would love to hear your answer. Well, at this point in my career, I, I don't really care. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, okay, I'm gonna get philosophical and a bit dark. Go here, ahead, I like it, tell so me. my favorite comedian of all time is Norm Macdonald, right? I love Norm Macdonald, uh, may he rest in peace. And he had, he, I don't think he made up this quote, but I saw him say this in an interview and it's true and it's very liberating, but if you believe that the universe is infinite, right? Like the world will continue to go on long after I'm gone, after you're mm -hmm. gone, after anything and everything, any fraction of time measured against infinity hmm. equals zero. Do you know what I'm saying? Hmm. Like even if I live to 100 years old, 100 years when put next to infinity, which the universe is, is zero. Hmm. It's nothing. And if you, it's gonna sound funny and kind of dark, but if you walk around knowing that, how insignificant and inconsequential all of this is, what a miracle it is that we're even here, right? That we're in this room right now, that mm. you're, you've got this money to do the show, I got this job here. We're all blessed all the time to even be here. We're specks mm. in the theme of the universe. Everything becomes kind of funny and you just kind of try to live in the present and enjoy the experience. That's how I do it. So I'm like, I didn't get a job, cool. There's not a war happening right now mm -hmm. in my city. I have food. <laughs> and you woke up live. today. I woke yeah. up today. Yeah. Like, I mean, I love to ask people this questions. Like I have days where I do, I've been doing this like gratitude journal for the last five years. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it started out with this email chain that I'm in with friends from Paris. And then also like here I have like a written where I do it. And you know, sometimes it's like, I'm like, oh my God, like I kind of live higher up and I can see the clouds and the mountain and the ocean, mm -hmm. like, oh my God. And then there's days where I don't feel like that. Mm -hmm. And it is it is the reality sure. of life. There sure. are days where I'm like, man, like, you know, at this time in my life, when I, I was it, in yeah. my 20s, like I should right. be like, you know, right. but then I have days like I've had, to be honest, I've had a really good year. I feel very, very blessed. That's awesome. I, I, inside of me, I feel like I've been doing the things that I love. But even amongst that, there's peaks and valleys, right? So yep. I love to know, like, of course, that is yeah. a great, great way of thinking. Yeah. But is there like a practice? I don't know if you know, I used to teach yoga. I was kind of like a yogi for a while. Okay, I yes. cut off my hair. I was oh. in Bali studying yoga. I right went on. to Vipassana okay. and married, meditating like 10, 11 hours a day. You know, I have like little things that yeah. I like to do that I'm like, okay, come back to the breath, which is kind of like yeah. what's yours. So I want to hear from you. Is there a practice that you like to do when things aren't super 100%? Which yes. is, you know, perhaps like not booking the job maybe doesn't affect you anymore. But maybe on a day, on a certain day, if it does, what do you do? Do you call up a friend? Do you, yeah. well, like... Well, I mean, to be clear, like, mm -hmm. I, obviously, I've, I get depressed sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, everyone gets depressed. Mm -hmm. I hate, but I honestly, like, I, a comedy, I listen mm -hmm. to a lot of comedy. Like, I really like, well, I, I find that really helps. Mm -hmm. And I just, when I'm feeling down, I try to return to gratitude and return to perspective. Mm. I, you know, you turn on the news and you see there are many, many places where daily existence is hell. Hell. Mm -hmm. For a number of reasons. For lack of food, lack of resources, war. So when I'm feeling down, I try to zoom out and, and, and reflect on all the things I have to be grateful for. And, and then again... Sometimes when I when I really zoom out and picture like how small the Earth is in the scale of the universe, it just makes me laugh because mm -hmm. it's all so silly. And, and it's so true. And the, your perspective was truly, truly valid. 
Like it's mm. really, really, you know, and it's like there was a time like I was like, no, I'm like peachy keen all the time sure. or at least through social media versus inside I'd be going through things versus now it's like here I like talking about that stuff because yeah. I think it's like a very human emotion yeah. like the the s spectrums and especially when we are the ones putting ourselves out there mm -hmm. and you know it's taken me time to be like okay I that audition was great I didn't get a call back I thought that was a great great moment <laughs> you know I paid money for this coaching <laughs> you know it was a great, great yeah, but you yeah. know I never thought that I would just enjoy auditioning like right. you yeah. know and it's like this is gonna sound funny and l like it's only over the last two years that I'm like wow like I'm just enjoying like this the process yeah yeah because yeah. I'm like I kind of grew in this I did some work here that I didn't think that I could do yeah and I grew and like, okay, now I'm gonna rip it and I'm also gonna delete this in here. Right. Because there was a time I would keep them because I'm yes. like, look at this. And yeah. then also feel yeah. terrible about not getting a call back. Yep. Forget yep. booking, but I, only oh, getting. I, listen, I, I, we've all been on those different, listen, when I was doing extra work, you know, and working the graveyard shift at my gym, I don't know if you remember that, I used to work the graveyard shift at-, at Fitness World? At Fitness World, yeah. I definitely. But I didn't know you worked the graveyard shift. I didn't. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I worked. I worked from 9 p.m. until 6 a.m. And I'm sure back then, if I had a call back, I was checking my phone every two seconds to see if I got it right. Refresh, I'm, refresh. I, I'm sure, refresh. but I'm 44. You know, like, God forbid, if I never am on set again, or if if tomorrow it, that's the end of the journey, I, my last thought will be how lucky I was. Mm. That's how I feel right now. Mm. But that I feel like I've I've been so blessed in my life and career that I don't really stress out about the other stuff now. Mm. Like you know, like like oftentimes people are like, oh, like w if I when I get to do this, I'll be happy. Like I feel like I'm doing the things that I want to be doing now. Mm. <laughs> you know, it kind of sounds like you know, going back to the philosophical what you were saying, you're almost like in a path of least resistance. You know, and mm. like. Um, like yogic philosophy or like Deepak uh. Chopra's like laws of success book. You know, I, oh. I read a lot of yeah. that kind of stuff, you know, and he will talk about is like the less you resist because that's almost you trying to push to make something happen versus when you're in the flow, right. when you're allowing things to happen because there's a flow and time yeah. for things, yeah, you know, totally. which it sounds like you're in a very content place. Yeah, I'm just, I, I mean, I'm also just tired because I work all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's what it is. But I, but I just feel like, I don't know. I don't have a like. If I win an Oscar, I'll feel like mm -hmm. I made it. Or if I win a, I, I don't have. The, I've, mm -hmm. I've never really had that, right? Mm -hmm. I, my, my ambitions are more about like freedom and mental peace and yeah. I don't know. That might sound a little new agey, but I, no, mental peace is like. It's something um, I was speaking to a friend of mine who uh, was doing was one of the main makeup artists of a show that was filming even before mm. the the strike ended. Mm. Um, and you know, I was having this conversation uh, that I really feel like peace is the goal. Like yeah. at forty one, like yeah. you know, having I think something shifts. People talk about it, mm -hmm. but something did shift for me at 40. Yeah. I had a J-O-B in between auditioning and creative work I was doing. And I woke up one day after a long weekend having a feeling of like I just turned 40. It was like a month after. And having this feeling of like, what am I doing? Like, you mm. know, I don't want the fail safe thing. I want to risk it yeah. all and like the idea yeah. for me yeah you know and it's like before that i consulted just mm -hmm. been freelance all these years but just during covid i got something that i was like okay this is gonna this is adulting now because you know i'm xyz age da, 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 mm -hmm. versus listening to the calling of my heart which perhaps when i was younger may have been around the fame and all of that sure. versus now i feel like it was more in line with I just want to be a creative person in general. Well, it, it's, I don't know if you think the same way, but it's also like when I started, I'll, even, I'll say we, because we're mm -hmm. around the same age, we started pre-social media, right? Mm -hmm. and I, let me know if we're at time. And MySpace, there was MySpace. There was MySpace. Back. Yeah, but like, or starting out, just no, starting. Start. But yeah. nobody in the 90s, when they 
had a dream to be a creative or be an actor was thinking about followers or influence. Yeah. And I know now I sound, this sounds like some real back in my day, shit, but it, it's true, right? When I started acting, my heroes were De Niro and uh, Pacino, and I, I wanted to like transform. So it's also the business has changed so much too that the, that I don't actually I don't actually know if I would pursue an acting career if I was 18 now I don't know if I'd pursue an acting career you know what I mean like it's a very different business than it was when I started I'm mm. very blessed I'm happy that I'm in it mm. but the, part of the reason I pivoted to voice is because I feel like voice is still about the craft and the art form mm. versus all the other things that go with with TV mm. that I'm not all that interested in mm. yeah and Going back to voice, which I found like, you know, I, I feel like I've dabbled and done things like mm. here and there this year and it's just been so, a part of it was this doesn't matter. Like right. I'm bringing my yeah. experience. Totally. I'm bringing my life experience, my, my, you know, it's mm -hmm. like they're bringing me in, in for, yeah. Being, yeah. And that felt really freeing. Yeah, it's the, it's the best. <laughs> The best. Not that again. Oh, by the way, if any casting or watching, if you want to give me a series regular, I will take it. <laughs> don't take this wrong way. I just don't want to disrupt my entire life to try and get it. If it comes my way, I'm happy to have it. I just I'm good if it doesn't though. But we're available for work. <laughs> ready and willing to work. So, we talked about yeah. his age and he's with <laughs> characters ready, to, well, ready to rock and roll. I'm with Red Management. Shout out Murray Gibson. <laughs> he's an amazing, amazing. Age. I'm with Red Management for principal. For, for principal. Voila. <laughs> Omari, this has been so lovely. Before I let you go, I love asking everyone who comes on the show this. And this may sound, again, mm -hmm. new agey. Sure. Because we are new agey over here. Yeah. My first show, my first production company was called Inspired Life. The show mm -hmm. I did earlier this year was called The Inspired Life Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I love hearing different people's perspective in what inspires you in life? Mm. What inspires yeah. you to jump out of the bed in the morning? What inspires you on a good day, on a bad day? I feel like uh, I'm inspired by people, of course. I'm inspired by great works of art, like a great movie, a great album, a great song even. Um, I'm, insp I'm inspired by people who, who create things with, without cynicism. Like people who create things not for profit, not for clout, not for fame, but because they have a unique perspective they want to share and they're creating something original that hasn't been done before, that's what inspires me. Whether that's art or a great meal or, yeah, people who, who create things with integrity and honesty. Mm, from the soul. From the soul, exactly. Yeah. That's a great way to end the show. <laughs> well, there you go. Thank you so much for walking out in the rain. My pleasure. And, you know, uh, we're happy to lend you an umbrella <laughs> if you need to go back. It's all right. Yeah. And Omari Newton, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Zara Durrani. If you felt inspired, make sure to let us know. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I'll speak to you soon. Ciao.